Good evening, everyone. It gives, gives me great pleasure to introduce to you, on the occasion of his inaugural lecture, our new Professor of Internet Studies at the Oxford Internet Institute, Professor Philip Howard. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the Proctor, Proctors and Beadle for ushering me in. Welcome, everyone. It's a warm room, but I do hope to keep you entertained and at least give you some things to think about, enough to distract from the heat. My goal for my 45 minutes or so is to answer the question that I posed in the title of my talk. I want to tell a few stories. I've had some coaching on what an inaugural lecture uh, looks like, and I've had the pleasure of uh, watching Professor Bill Dutton's talk from a few years ago. So my understanding is that this is something of a personal journey, something about uh, something of a review of research, and that it should be something of a provocation for the great challenges that are ahead of us, um, for those of us in the social sciences. It's also very important to me to communicate to you the excitement I feel for working at Oxford, and especially the Oxford Internet Institute. And one of the things that makes it exciting to study this stuff at this moment is that we increasingly have new tools to play with um, as research goes. And one of the uh, risks of playing with new technologies is that we have to come up with new concepts for what we do. So, for example, does it count as a selfie if the camera you use covers 360 degrees? and smiling. <laughs> Thank you. Now, there are several things I'd like to say. Um, let me start with a bit of an outline. First of all, I want to go over what it means to be at the OII and what it means to work at the OII at this time. Second, I'd like to answer the question, or at least provide my answer for this question. Is social media killing our democracy? Then I want to go to the real problem, right? Because the real problem is never in the question. It's always something else. So I'm going to deflect to the thing, the topic that I think we need to be studying next. And uh, my epilogue will be a methods epilogue, perfect for the methodology geeks in the room. Um, I am told I get to say some things, make some unsafe generalizations about entire disciplines. So I'm going to do that in my, do that in my epilogue. Um, I've had the pleasure of watching several of these kinds of talks, and um, I've also had the pleasure of walk, um, watching Bill Dutton and um, my director, Helen Margetts, uh, do a review of the words that are in the title of the organization I now work for. Why Oxford? Why an institute? And why the internet? <coughs> several of these things I'm not going to tackle. So uh, why Oxford is, is fairly straightforward to answer. Um, Oxford is at the center of innovations in artificial intelligence, in digital ethics. It is the place where innovations um, in multiple domains of technology uh, are, uh, are, have started or are being advanced. Um, the institute itself is connected in many ways to many other units on the campus, um, in the city, and around the world. So Oxford is the logical place to have a an outfit that studies technology, technology diffusion, and cultures of use. I'm not going to tackle too much the question of whether this is really an institute. Um, this, uh, in my opinion, it's more of a school. But every word like this has its baggage. As an institute, this organization has been graduating 30 or 40 of the world's best social data scientists for about 10 years. So it's a degree-granting body that is at the center of inquiry between the computer sciences and the social sciences. It's not an institute. Let me start, then, with this tougher question. Why the internet? Now, there have been several answers. Dutton's answer several years ago was that um, the internet is a complex platform for many different kinds of technologies. Um, when I've seen my colleague, Professor Margetz, give this uh, rundown of the three key words, she references the internet as a thing that belongs to many different kinds of technologies that no longer have browsers. So um, windmills, embedded devices in our bodies, and yes, driverless cars. These are the internet now. But I want to make 
the point that the internet we have now, that we need to study now, is misnamed because there are, unfortunately, several internets. There are multiple internets. There's one that seems contained or at least served up around the world, primarily through Facebook. Significant numbers of people, hundreds of millions, primarily experience the internet through this thing called Facebook. There is another internet that young people use that none of us have used. Um, we believe it occurs or is lived over Snapchat, Kick, or Yik Yak. Um, no, I don't use these things. Um, but these are our platforms that provide internet content for the under 17 crowd. Um, there are clearly distinct ecosystems of news readership across countries, across regime types. We've known of small communities of extremists where the worst forms of hate speech thrive. These people live in their own internet at this point. Now the subnetworks of far-right, conspiratorial, junk news consumers actually seem to be quite large and to some degree vote in blocks. I put it again that there is another internet in, the chi in China, a separate one that we know very little about and have difficulty studying. For years, this internet has been built from the ground up as an infrastructure for social control, surveillance. It has the same chatting, texting, and informational functions we'd all recognize in the West, um, but it's a fair, fairly clear that it is a tool for social control. Um, and there'd be others among us who would um, argue that Russia has the same platform or that Iran has the same thing, a distinct internet. In this way, the internet is not just the technologies, the pieces of hardware, the software that makes packets fly. Um, it's the cultures of use that are effectively so different that it's tough for us to study them. So, is social media killing democracy? I'm going to start here with a bit of the, the personal journey in, my ans in answering this question. I want to go through the books and explain how they fit together to build to the current research agenda. My first book was an ethnography of the Gore and the Bush campaigns in 2000. As you may remember, this was an election that went into overtime. It went 13, 14 months for a variety of reasons. I had a job with the Gore campaign, I had a job with the Bush campaign, and I followed them around. One of the things that I discovered was able to demonstrate through this experience was the degree to which a fairly small community of technology designers, some 20, 25 people, make very significant design decisions that have an impact on how all of you now experience democracy. And there are people who go to the pubs together, they work across the aisles, they work for Republicans or Democrats as needed. Towards the end of my field work, I was surprised to see at the end of the presidential campaign that several of these folks went overseas. They went to work in the UK and Canada and Australia in the next year after the year 2000. Two years later, they were in Germany. They went to Israel, practicing their trade. Three years later, they went to Saudi Arabia. They went to Russia. They went to China to take the tricks that they had developed with big money in public opinion manipulation in the United States to apply them to other democracies around the world. And this is how innovation in political communication circulates now. So my subjects were traveling overseas. They were taking the ideas that they developed in the United States context into other domains. And for me, the interesting problem then became not so much how do elites in democracies manage public opinion, but what do these technologies, these exciting new opportunities for political expression, what do they mean for countries where the culture of use is greatly constrained. The first book was with Cambridge, the second book is with Oxford, and it is a study of 75 countries with significant Muslim com communities. And I picked these, these particular countries for, for particular reasons. These are the countries in which censorship and surveillance are permitted, uh, encouraged, as a means of cultural protection. So these are regimes that like to roll out information technologies to participate in the global political economy of information technologies, but in constrained ways. And here, studying several different kinds of countries, I found noticeable changes in what politics meant. So even in the toughest of regimes, 
where you would never see executive turnover, right? You'd never see the head of the, the, head of the country uh, change office. There were significant changes in gender politics. There were significant changes in where average people would go to learn about religious texts. And there were significant changes in what people were imagining was religious freedom. So the internet by the mid 2000s was the platform by which young women learned to talk about love in cultures where marriages are arranged. The internet was the place where people with spiritual questions about their life course could choose to go to mullahs, imams, who were not their community imams. These differences had a significant impact on political Islam, and within a few years, it was pretty clear that the modern form of activism in North Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia was a story of young people using information technologies to figure out that they shared grievances, that they could see what life was like in countries uh, where the freedom of religion uh, existed. And these technologies were the means by which they found each other, organized their streets, and uh, organized their protests on the street, and we found a very clear arc to the Arab Spring several distinct stages in which some digital image of a human rights atrocity spread quickly, usually over Facebook, activated tens of thousands, if not millions of people, to go to the streets and change the calculus by which people feared dictators. On the streets of Cairo, it became dangerous to stay at home. The risks of staying at home and not joining the protests became greater than the risks of joining the streets, for joining the protest in the streets for a few moments on a key day. This is important because for several decades, four particular dictators had reigned for 20, 30, 40 years. And an entire generation of young people had grown up under a constrained media, not knowing any other political options. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, reminding you of these stories to remind you all of the excitement we felt about 10 years ago over the potential of social media, over the, the ability of social media and the internet to blossom new social movements and encourage democracy advocates. The next project became about understanding where technology was going. So, the first one was about understanding how political elites and democracies use technology to manipulate a public opinion. The second project was about understanding how democracy advocates use technology to catch dictators off guard. The third was an attempt to look ahead, and in a sense, uh, this is the one that uh, failed, or at least got the toughest reviews. Um, it turns out that when you try to write for a public audience, you have to you run the risk of upsetting the usual scholarly audience. Now, um, this was a book with Yale University Press, um, but um, the critics would say it spent too much time on what they called futurism. Trying to understand what's coming ahead in the next 10 years, I would argue as a social scientist, requires a good look at what has happened over the last 10 years. And by 2015, We'd had 20 years of the internet, right? The internet was effectively privatized in 1995 by the NSF. So there were decades of, de there was decades of research at this point about what the internet was and what its political potential could be. But this book was about the new internet of things. The internet of things is the next internet. It's the one you will not experience through a browser. It's the one that will track you in almost everything you do. And for a variety of reasons, it will generate almost perfect behavioral data that will be useful to social scientists, but also useful to governments and security services. So in this book, I argue that there are several things we have to wrestle with in the next few years. Um, the question of who gets this data and why and when. Uh, the question of what the data will be applied to and, you know, I set up the false dichotomy in the sense how the Internet of Things may set us free or lock us up. If there's anything to be learned about how governments are reacting to the current use of social media, it's likely that the Internet of Things will lock us up. <coughs> Let me
me say a little bit about how um, I've transitioned, and I'm going to return to the Internet of Things. I've transitioned here at Oxford to this new program of research on social media and um, fake news. There's several ingredients to what we're calling now computational propaganda. And at its basic, basic sense, computational propaganda includes algorithms and lies. Now, may I do a, a quick poll of you? How many of you, I believe there's 120, how many of you have a smartphone? Would you raise your hands? That is everyone, thank you. Is there anyone who does not have a smartphone? Three. Three, including the Beatle. Wonderful. Including the Beatle. Wonderful. So, um, the average smartphone has uh, 23 apps on it. The average app generates one location point per minute. So those of you who are in the room with a smartphone are generating 23 location points per minute, that is, little bits of evidence that we are all physically co-present. Now, if there's 120 people in the room, you can imagine this is an immense amount of data about where we are in physical space. At the moment, there are very few organizations that have the analytical capacity to play with this data. Uh, Facebook does. Uh, there are very few platforms that do much with this data. Advertising firms do. And there are only a few of these apps that have actually rolled out that now read each other's data. So anything that you contribute through an application, photos, um, text, becomes fodder for an immense surveillance industry that is both about providing you with better consumer goods, it's about uh, identifying your location in space, um, and it's uh, about providing uh, data brokers with wealth. I have behind me, beside me, an example of what a bot is. Now, I'm going to return to this flow of data towards the end of my talk, but for a moment I want to walk you through some examples of what an automated account does during a political conversation. It turns out to be very difficult to operationalize fake news, these things we're, these things we're discussing now, um, in the, certainly in the popular press. It's very difficult to understand how to identify a bot. There are some giveaways. Bots tend to do negative campaigning. Uh, there are no automated accounts, there are very few automated accounts that report positive public policy ideas or exciting new initiatives from um, major politicians, think tanks, or universities. Uh, most bots, most of the automation expresses anger, expresses moral judgment, shares photos of politicians caught at a ridiculous angle saying something that they perhaps never actually said. This is one of my favorites. Um, in studying the Brexit debate last summer, we noticed a handful of accounts that migrated from another topic. This one in particular uh, had been studying Israel's ac activities in Palestine for, and had been tweeting about Israel's activities in Palestine for several years, uh, but then became uh, interested in Brexit. A small handful of accounts after uh, working on Brexit uh, then became interested in the election in the United States and uh, were surprisingly pro-Trump. Then another small number of these accounts transitioned to being experts in Italian politics in time for the referendum, and then the German election, and then the French election, and now back to the UK. So just as there was a cycle of expertise from my human subjects in the United States who took the craft of political manipulation across multiple domains, multiple regime types, there are now users who have humans behind them but there are social media accounts, user accounts, that also craft political messages, moving from target to target, meddling in particular domains as needed. And I think one of the great research questions that faces us now is who are these people? And perhaps to some degree, how do we inoculate our democracies against their ill effects? I have a very few slides of data for you, but I think they should help exemplify what it is that I study now and why it's important. Um, this is a very simple tr trace of the data, the Twitter activity uh, between the pro-Clinton accounts and the pro-Trump accounts in the 10 days leading up and eight days leading up to the US election. There's three things that we can say, two or three things actually we can say about this data. First of all, it's noteworthy that there is a moment on the night of the election when the 
the proportion of neutral hashtags exceeds all the other ideological hashtags. Social media is still, in key moments, a very powerful tool for collective conversations about political acts. These are primarily tweets about how, how people voted. Right? They're very simple, they're very straightforward. These moments are rare, but they do exist. The second notable thing is that the pro-Trump hashtags um, almost always outpace the use of the pro-Clinton hashtags. Um, that was uh, one of the big findings from, what, from our research memo, and in a sense, it's um, no longer a surprise. There were significant numbers of uh, programmers, Russian-based bot attacks, uh, libertarians based in the United States, and the Trump campaign itself uh, behind the automated messaging that kept up this deluge of mostly anger and sexism during the U.S. election. <coughs> now... Aside from the flow of traffic that you can see on a daily basis uh, between the pro-Trump and the pro-Clinton pro supporters in the U.S. election, we can also track the accounts that we believe were highly automated. Now, um, you've heard me refer a little bit to bots, that is, chunks of code that take content and tweet in an automated way. I prefer to refer to highly automated accounts because there is always a human behind these accounts curating in some ways. And uh, part of our work involves ethnographic exposure and the big data analysis. And when we meet the people who design these accounts, they all think of themselves as patriots. They're, they're coding for the nation. This is a form of political speech that needs to be respected for them. So. In the eight days leading up to the big decision on November 8th, the proportion of automated account was roughly, a, uh, automated activity was roughly a fifth of that generated by humans. Two other things you'll note from this image. We rely very heavily on Twitter's accessible API that's easier to study data from Twitter. Um, one of the things that makes it easy is that they make 1% of the sample of all the data available for, the pu to, for public use. Um, we capped out on the night of the election. Uh, we hit the 1%. In other, one, in other words, 1% of the global traffic on election night in, around the world was about the U.S. election. So this is a methodology flaw. But I would say there's another more important methodology flaw, and that is that this activity, the reason we all study Twitter, is because Facebook does not share. There is no way to get the equivalent data from Facebook. They do not share. They perhaps do this research in-house, but again, do not share that. So most of us are forced to study or work with Twitter data because of its accessibility. A fifth of the conversation about politics in the week before the election was automated we miss a significant amount of the data we know we need to understand how people talk about politics today. And then interestingly, in the last day, these automated accounts after Trump had won fizzled. Somebody turned them off. Somebody shut them down. So these accounts are not simply up and running and regurgitating uh, the same old content or, or following other bots and regurgitating content in a, a regularized way. There are human actors behind these accounts. And one, of the other one of the other observations we made in studying the debates is that the automated accounts shifted strategy over time. So in the first debate, the accounts that declared Hillary had won uh, went to work around the same time that the accounts that thought Trump had won. By the third debate, Trump, Trump's campaign and the people campaigning for Trump released his automation declaring that he had won the debates before the debates were broadcast. Right. We picked up the spike in activity before the debates were even broadcast. So this, this kind of automation is clearly an important part of contemporary campaign strategy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, what we have behind computational propaganda is the automation, the algorithms, and the lies. Everybody I speak to about um, fake news, or as I prefer to call it, junk news, reminds me that fake news or junk news is a very old phenomenon. Um, it's a political tactic that dates centuries, if not millennia. It was probably Aristotle who gave us um, the fundamentals of logical reasoning. And I increasingly believe that if we could just teach the 
20 or so Latin, um, Latin phrases for argumentative fallacies, we would be basically be able to disassemble the public understanding of what, um, what these lies, um, what, how these messages work. The favorite, my favorite kinds of lies are actually the ones that involve little bits of scholarly research. And so um, what counts as fake news, when you look at large collections of fake news, is often commentary posing as news, uh, done with the New York Times font or the BBC, color, uh, BBC colors. It's often uh, news that starts off with a few facts but then degrades quickly. Or it's research that's gone bad. And I have a few of my favorite examples to help entertain you. Um, you know some of the best uh, from uh, campaigning in this country. Um, uh, from the United States, there was the Pizzagate chunk of fake news. There was the fake news about how Hillary Clinton had killed two FBI officers by burning them in their beds. There's a range of these stories that we now think of as absurd, but were so well distributed that measurable proportions of the American electorate still believe them. Among my favorite examples of public opinion research gone wrong, I have three, uh, one of which I'll go into detail. Um, the first involves public opinion research on how undergraduates in the 1960s performed better on exams after listening to 10 minutes of classical music. Um, this research became the basis for a significant industry in uh, preparing classical music, mostly Mozart, for mommies to put uh, mega uh, headphones on their bellies to play classical music for their babies. Um, there are other examples of social science going off the rails, mostly through public opinion research that gets misinterpreted. Um, there's significant research on uh, public understanding of genetically modified foods. And a study from about six years ago, one of my favorites, which found that 80% of Americans, I'm sorry to keep drawing on examples from the US, 80% of Americans would like to see any food with DNA in it to be labeled as having DNA in it. <laughs> one of my favorite examples uh, comes from the New York Times magazine several years ago, in which a, a reporter, a story, um, a contributing reporter wrote, about a recent Zogby poll, which found that 51% of Americans, apologies Americans, 51% of Americans believe that primates are entitled to the same rights as children. What the reporter failed to do, however, of course, was go back to the original source. And this was particularly interesting because the reporter was the Knight Professor of Journalism at Berkeley. The original question in the survey asked about chimpanzees, not primates. Uh, and respondents could say that chimps ought to be treated, A, like property, B, similar to children, C, the same as adults, or D, not sure. In the reporting, the phrase similar to children morphed into the same rights as human children. Uh, the reporter also failed to mention that the poll was sponsored by the Doris Day Animal Rights League, um, a group that had hired Zogby to help come up with good numbers. So, fake news is many things. Um, it can be good research that becomes bad knowledge. For that reason, I think the fake news crisis or the junk news crisis is partly about us and our ability to communicate our research to the public. It's safe to say that a modern research agenda must involve staff who spend a quarter of their time on dissemination. If you do not do that, your good ideas will not have an impact. The project I'm working on now is called the Project on Computational Propaganda. Several of my colleagues and collaborators are here, here now. Um, and what we're finding is that there's deliberate strategy behind the use of fake news. There's deliberate strategy behind the way in which the fake news gets shared. And some of the effects that we know about are still identifiable in the data. So we've known for a while that selective exposure or elective affinity, there's two variations on this, plague dem democratic discourse, especially when it comes to the distribution of news. Voters do not get all the political news and information they need during an election. Instead, we rely on um, Secondhand information, intellectual shortcuts, um, trust to make choices about what we believe and, and how to vote. 
The selective exposure theory argues that most voters prefer supportive rather than discrepant messages. It's these kinds of messages that increase our own confidence that we're doing something right when we vote. We want to believe that we've made good decisions and we want to practice the art of good decisions when we participate, when we live a civic life. When Lazarsfeld, Berelson, and Godet studied how voters in Erie County got political news and information over 50 years ago, they found that people tend to selectively expose themselves to the media of their preferred candidate. And almost every study since has validated this finding. We still debate the explanations for selective exposure, but the, the problem is still there. Why do people selectively expose themselves to news and information they already believe? There are three explanations. The first is the partisanship explanation. So we rely, we need shortcuts. The fastest way to evaluate news is by relying on the ideological package we inherited the last time we voted liberal, lib dem, conservative, labor. If we've already expressed a preference for a particular candidate, we'll select messages that strengthen, not weaken that, pre that, prefer that preference. Effectively, this means that voters tend not to change political parties or favored candidates because they're unlikely to voluntarily or proactively acquire different information. The more interested a voter is in a subject, the more likely the selective attention phenomenon will appear. The second, and these are rival explanations, so the rival hypothesis is that it's, is that it's not about party affiliation, it's about what people call, scholars call schemata cognitive representations. This has more to do with uh, high school and how we've learned about science and public life in high school. Whereas the partisanship explanation emphasizes that we act with cognitive economy by applying to ideological frames or deferring to figureheads, the schemata explanation emphasizes that we take shortcuts that depend on ready-made prior knowledge. It's easier to repeat the conclusions or the analytical process that we've already gone through once. Information itself has a kind of gatekeeping role, such that we rely on things we already know and believe, rather than relearn science or relearn facts for each new policy issue. The third possibility is that we rely on selective exposure because we don't want to face cognitive dissidence. We don't want the shock of having to admit that we were wrong last time. Research on cognitive dissonance um, if for online exposure is minimal and probably one of the things we need to be working on next. It's plausible, however, because investigations of contacts collapse over social media has revealed that people have very real jarring experiences when presented with unexpected information and social anecdotes over digital media. So the task at hand for us, for me, and to some degree for you, involves figuring out what the opposite of selective exposure is. It's a phenomenon that's been around for 50 years. Uh, diversified exposure, we don't even actually, as a field of inquiry, have the phrase for the opposite of selective exposure. Randomized encounters, um, empathic affinity, whatever the process is that, include, that allows people to encounter a few new pieces of information, candidates they haven't met before, or faces, they don't recognize from their own community. Whatever those social processes are, we have to find them, identify them, and encourage, and encourage them. Let me move now to the real problem. I think my answer to this question, is social media killing democracy, is that social media has made democracy weak. It has a compromised immune system. We had, for several years, an exciting moment where social media seemed to help democracies bloom and seemed to help creative new, make creative new ideas, new ideas for political organization flourish. That learning curve where the advances and excitement that comes from activists have transitioned to tools of control for dictators, we've, we've gone through that learning curve. The next big step for us is whether we'll be able to shape the internet to come. I'm among relatively few who think that we've actually lost the privacy war for the internet we have now. Um, 
in the first book I did on data mining in the US election, one of the stories I, f I discovered was about how uh, women who put contraceptives purchases on their credit cards were having that data bought and sold by the pro-life and pro-choice movements in the United States. Because if you're putting contraceptives on your credit cards, you're clearly not pro-life. Both sides of the debate on uh, the right to choose, so the right to life, make use of the same kind of credit card data. And this is an example from the year 2000, right? How, how political inferences get made from behavioral data. The next great challenge for us is how the Internet of Things, right, the smart light bulbs that record your location in space, um, how this kind of data gets used for political inferences. There are several ideas, um, and of course now is the time to restart my device. Um, there are several ways, several things we can do to try to create, I'm sort of tempted to let this run, just as, as a make it a, a test. Um, there are several things we can do to shape the Internet that we're going to get. Industry estimates are that by 2020, some 50 billion wireless sensors will, will be distributed around the world. And by 2020, to keep this in perspective, we'll be at 10 billion people <clears throat> approaching, nine, something, nine and a half. There will be many more times the number of people there will be many more wireless sensors. And to be on the Internet of Things, you need an address, you need some kind of sensor, you need a power pack. And there's significant power challenges to solve before we're living in an Internet of Things. But there will be many more devices than people. And this is to say nothing of dust satellites, drones, and the other mobile phones that you already carry. So the amount of behavioral data on our daily coffee consumption and our milk consumption, our consumption of goods, is going to grow immensely. And certainly in democracies, every lobbyist who can play with data such as this will try to play with this data. Now, um, in the book that nobody liked, I offered four ideas for how to build an Internet of Things that might actually service some of our civic goals. The first idea is to report the ultimate beneficiary. Now, this is an idea uh, borrowed, stolen from the Blood Diamonds campaign. One of the great innovations of that campaign was the notion that you could trace any particular diamond, its path through the market, and assign value to that diamond, and hopefully sell that diamond at a higher markup because of its traceable history. When you purchase a new coffee maker or refrigerator, you may not ever do this, but you should have the right to ask it to tell you who is benefiting from your behavioral data. I would argue that that's a, a basic human right for the Internet of Things to come. The second innovation, policy innovation, I would like to see would be the possibility that we could add to the list of beneficiaries. So simply knowing which government is keeping track of your data or which coffee companies are tracking your, comp your coffee consumption could be useful. If you have a favorite Haitian fair trade coffee collective that you'd like to support, you as a citizen should be able to add civil society actors to the list of beneficiaries. So the first idea for the Internet of Things that might actually be a civic one we would want would be to have devices report who's benefiting from the data. The second would be to allow additional organizations to benefit from that data. The third, and you'll probably tell that I'm getting increasingly fantastic with these possibilities, the third possibility would be an Internet of Things that tithes. Civil society groups today thrive on data it is increasingly difficult to, for them to win public policy, um, win on public policy outcomes without rich data that they can play with. The information infrastructure, the bandwidth, the hardware, the software, uh, providing these things for civil society actors as a counter to what firms have and as a counter to what governments have is a way of restoring some balance to the imbalance in political power we now have. Now, in a sense, I'm arguing for uh, the rule of law, right? A balance among actors in a political system. But let's keep in mind that Facebook essentially has a monopoly platform position on public life in most countries.
There are a few countries that have built their own tools, um, their own platforms, but again, uh, this is Russia and China. They've built those platforms for other things. So, building an Internet of Things that tithes, gives 10% of the bandwidth, the processing power, the data, to civil society groups, perhaps some academics, um, doctors to play with. There will be immense amounts of public health data and, and things we can learn from this behavioral data that will largely go to lobbyists and technology firms if, if the, the rules don't prescribe otherwise. The fourth possibility is an extension of what we call in data mining, um, those of us who study data mining, the nonprofit rule um, in data mining. There are very few regulations that govern the purchase of data. In the United States, the one that is most important is that you cannot profit by selling voter registration files. You can profit by selling everything else, uh, so the information about your magazine purchases and where you get your gas, all that kind of stuff is valuable when it's attached to voter registration files, but you're not supposed to strictly charge clients for that data. I would argue that the range of variables we consider exempt from a profit should grow. And I don't have a laundry list yet, but we could all imagine a set of basic public health variables, uh, basic education, social inequality variables that could be reclassified as being part of the public domain, as being things that we will learn about through this new Internet of Things, which will be immersed in, in 2020, but, but variables that will end up in the BOD for us to process in a systematic way for the public good. In 10 years, almost every object that is human-made will have a chip in it. So the question is not so much, is the internet, is the social media killing democracy? The question is, what can we learn from how social media has impacted democracy to make this next internet one that will set us free? Let me get to a bit of an epilogue. Um, I've been coached that I'm allowed to make some disciplinary generalizations and say some outrageous things. So here's where I, where I'll be truly outrageous. The first point I'd like to make is that the social sciences are dying. And they're dying in the sense that for several decades now, we have been teaching students that quantitative modeling, um, regression analysis, is the primary way through which to make generalizations. We have greatly overemphasized the role of quantitative methods in social research. In my particular domain of democracy, democratization, regime change, we get very excited when we find models of more than 10% explained variation. Now, what we do uh, when we model things is think with through theory of the dozen factors that might plausibly explain an outcome, and we look to see which variables might be statistically significant. Um, statisticians, of course, will say that any model is a statistically significant improvement over no model at all. Um, in correspondence with a colleague to prepare for tonight's um, talk, I worked with a colleague who's analyzed over 500 models from the major journals in which we publish, uh, 300 different published studies using multiple different kinds of statistical techniques. Um, she found that the average explained variance for the models, this is basically the punchline for all these pieces of research, is 24%. This means that the standard for contemporary social research is in explaining a quarter of all the things that we can observe in public life. And to flip this, this means, of course, that 76% of the things that would explain some social outcome are not in the models. Now, my similar accusation would be a uh, similar accusation I would level at the computer sciences, which I believe are largely unfocused when it comes to public problems. Innovation occurs with little thought to impact. We wrestle with ethics, um, but sometimes as an addendum to something we've already done. Um, I have worked with several different kinds of computer scientists, many who are wonderful. Um, I remember a particularly interesting conversation about um, POO, P-O-O, 
which um, in the original point of the study was a look at a, um, an opposition movement in the Philippines. But as you know, if you turn poo into a hashtag, you get an immense amount of content. And my uh, computer science colleague was convinced that the Philippines was about to be rocked with revolution because of all the poo-related um, tweets. So um, this isn't true of all computer scientists, but it's certainly true that working together with the computer sciences and the social sciences produces much more satisfying outcomes that build on existing knowledge, that identify contemporary social problems, and are much more likely to land on good solutions. In conclusion, let me return to the OII. <clears throat> I firmly believe that the social sciences have gone off the rails um, in overemphasizing quantitative research. The richness of interpretation invariably comes from the ethnographers, the ethnomethodologists, the people who've done comparative work. What excites me about the OII is that I think we're going to save the social sciences and we're going to save the computer sciences. The advantage of the computer sciences when they generate big data to play with is that they work with the universe of cases. They tend not to worry about the same kinds of sampling frames because they get all the data in magnificent packages and often need help with interpretation. The social scientists who do qualitative work often generate wonderfully interpretive explanations, but are rarely able to generalize in the smart way. So what I think is special about the OII at this moment is not so much the, the succession of methods, but this fabulous combination of big data, computational social science with ethnography. It's the magical punchline of talking to people and doing field work with the immense data that you get through big, big data, computational analysis. That is the magical methodological way forward. And I think that's how the OII will save the social sciences and the computer sciences. Thank you all for your time. So you've given us something to be scared of and something to be worried about, about both democracy and about our own individual disciplines. And that's exactly what an inaugural lecture is supposed to do. So thank you very much. Everyone is now very welcome to join us in Balliol College for a reception. Thank you. <laughs>